We'll move to our second uh, paper by Professor Hartmut Lapin. Uh, Professor Lapin has been professor for ancient history at Goethe University Frankfurt am Main since 200, 000, uh, 2001. He, uh, then he was awarded the Leibniz Prize of the DFG in 2015. He was fellow at the Faculty of Classics in Cambridge and mem member of the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. Since 2019, he has been president of the Historisches Kolleg München. His main research interests are the history of ideas in the ancient world and late antiquity, with particular focus of, uh, on uh, non-classical traditions. Currently, he is a PI of a Dave Gay long-term project producing a new edition, translation, and commentary of John of Ephesus, Ecclesiastical History, one of the major understudied sources. Recent publications include Die Frühen Christen von den Anfängen bis Konstantin, um, English uh, translation preparation. The title of Professor Lapin's paper is anti calcedonians in, in a Difficult Region. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the kind introduction and for the inv invitation to be here. I'm very glad to be here and also to be a witness of your fight for freedom in these times. It's important not only for Israel, but for the Western world in general, I think, unfortunately. Um, and you see, I have a subtitle, meanwhile, which makes things more concrete. In the late Roman Empire, there were a number of places that exerted influence far beyond the borders of the empire and formed, under certain aspects, centers for neighboring regions. This is true, for example, of Alexandria, which radiated, radiated to Nubia and Ethiopia, of Edessa, which was of great importance as an educational center for the Syriac-speaking world and Armenia, but also, of course, of Jerusalem, the most important pilgrimage center of late antiquity. People from all over the world set out on the journey to this city. The Holy Land of the Christians seems to have had a specific significance for the peoples of the Caucasus, especially for Armenians and Georgians and Albanians, as the inhabitants of eastern Georgia are called in ancient sources, Iberians. I use both expressions indiscriminately in what follows. These peoples seem to have gained part of their cultural identity in the Holy Land. Monasteries seem to have played a special role in this process. The situation of the Caucasian nations was, after all, particularly complicated because they were exposed to both Christian, Byzantine, and Zoroastrian Persian influences. In any case, there was a strong mobility and also migration between Palestine and the Caucasus with considerable effects in the home region, for example, in liturgies, which others can judge much better than I can. Most Caucasians were not supporters of the Council of Chalcedon, which, however, was dominant in Palestine from about 453. Armenians had not been present at the Council because the country was involved in a war and had not subscribed to its decisions. The Georgian church had recognized Chalcedon since the late 6th century. Meanwhile, the situation in the second half of the 5th century is unclear. Apparently, there were opponents of the council. King Vachtang I Gogasali, who became the ideal ruler in Georgian, Georgian tradition, is said to have asked the Roman Emperor Zenon to ordain a Petros as Catholicos for Georgia through Acacius, whose name is associated with Ionotikon, that unsuccessful compromise proposal of the emperor. At the Council of Dwin in 556, the Georgians, in conjunction with the Armenians, seem to have rejected the decisions of Chalcedon. However, the source material for the history of Georgia during this period is extremely unfavorable. In contrast, the bishops of Jerusalem had been supporters of the council since 553 since Juvenal. After his return from the council, however, he had been able to prevail only with great difficulty. And thanks to the support of Emperor Marcion against an opponent of Chalcedon, Theodosius, who was also supported by Eudosia, the widow of Emperor Theodosius II, who lived in Jerusalem. She and her entourage were widely considered 
supporter, a supporter of Chalcedon's opponents. An endorsement of the Council of Chalcedon was fundamentally in the interest of the Bishop of Jerusalem, since his see had been upgraded in that assembly, vis-a-vis -vis Caesarea Maritima and Antioch. Nevertheless, violent opposition from anti chalcedonians continued in Palestine um, against Bishop Anastasius, Juvenal's successor. The latter successor, Martyrius, in turn was able to bring many opponents to his side. However, Jerusalem remained a center of the Chalcedonians. It is symptomatic that this bishopric hardly appears, for example, in the church history of the Miaphysite author John of Ephesus. However, in the second half of the fifth century, the fronts between the different directions that disputed about Chalcedon and that would become were unclear, were much more open. They were less rigid than later. That is why I do not speak of mere physicism in this context. In general, one should be cautious about attributing the whole region to the Chalcedonians or anti chalcedonians Groups tended to be concentrated in individual monasteries. There were also much monastic and urban centers of anti chalcedonians in Palestine. However, the choice of places was highly important. Especially in Palestine, there could be serious conflicts when it came to occupying holy places. For it was difficult to share holy places, even if this seems to have happened occasionally, as in Mamre, which we discussed this morning. Usually, there was a sharp division between Christian denominations. Bishop Theodosius, that opponent of Juvenal, had occasion in his short tenure to consecrate other anti chalcedonian bishops, including Peter the Iberian, for my humor near Gaza, on whom my talk will focus. He was henceforth considered a staunch, a staunch opponent of the Council of Chalcedon. His life was marked by many changes of place. Twice he chose Palestine as the destina destination of his migration, which he had to leave temporarily. Even after he had established himself permanently in Mayuma, he undertook many journeys, thus remaining mobile in Palestine and in neighboring regions. About his life inform mainly two authors. One is the priest and monk John Rufus, who describes himself in his works as a disciple of Peter. He is probably the author of the Pleroforiae, which contain anecdotes and sayings of Chalcedon's opponents, including Peter, and a detailed vita of Peter with 193 chapters according to the modern count. This vita also circulated in Chalcedonian circles and was used, for example, by the church historian Evagius Scholasticus. The translation of the Syriac version of the vita into Georgian, which took place in the 7th century at the earliest, describes him as a Chalcedonian, which suited the Chalcedonian creed of the Georgians and added regional material Otherwise, this translation, which has been called a Freie Nachdichtung, a free poetic redaction by Ephraim Lamitze, apparently offers no independent material related to the 5th century compared to the Syriac Vita. Therefore, I can leave it aside here, and I'm happy to do so, as I don't read Georgian. However, this tradition shows that Peter was not alone a controversial figure. His charisma as an ascetic may have contributed decisively to his transconfessional reputation. Our sources privilege confessional, divisive interpretations of events, but we must be very careful to follow them. Things are much more complicated on the ground, I think, and there were much more negotiations going on on the ground than our sources seem to su suggest prima vista. In addition, there are passages from works of Zechariah of Mytilini, both from his church history, the so-called Chronicle, and the Vita of Severus of Antioch. Peter was a paragon of monastic virtue for Severus, who was to become a leading exponent of mere physicism. The foundational work on Peter is by Cornelia Horn, who has emphasized, quite rightly, the importance of his asceticism and the claim of being a stranger to the world in establishing Peter's authority. She and Robert Phoenix have also produced an excellent and helpfully annotated translation of the Vita. However, the authors are cautious in the historical contextualization of this figure. 
I am concerned here, inspired by the conference topic, with a special aspect. In particular, I want to use Peter's Vita as a source to ask about the conditions, goals, and justifications of migration and mobility in 5th century Palestine, naturally involving an exceptional individual. In doing so, I evaluate the source on two levels, that of imaginaries of travel and that of realia, realities with which the author presupposes. This does not mean that I consider John's narrative um, narratives to be authentic in every case. It's often impossible to answer the question, but rather that the external conditions he presupposes must have seemed realistic in order for the narrative to be believed by his readership. The source is, of course, one-dimensional, since it wants to demonstrate Peter's holiness to the readers. To the readers. It must therefore always be read against the grain. This brings me to a brief outline of Peter's biography based essentially on the Vita of John Rufus, which of course introduces uncertainties. But the basic lines seem to be sufficiently confirmed by other sources, or at least plausible. Peter's birth name was Nabanurgios because he was Iberian. The year of birth, 411, is reasonably certain. He came from the royal family, which is said to have been Christian for a long time in the Vita, at the age of 12, during the reign of Theodosius the second Nabanugi arrived at the court of Constantinople as a hostage. Therefore, in the sources, he is mostly called Peter the Iberian, but Zacharias calls him in one place Peter the hostage. At court, he was apparently treated honorably and may even have held an office that gave him some, some function in reference to horses. In Constantinople, he could also observe strict forms of Christian life. Precaria, after all, had vowed childlessness. His contemporary Socrates describes the court as monastic. In any case, a strict and Christian habitus, a strictly Christian habitus, was part of Theodosius's self-presentation. Um, Peter also met the emperor's wife, Eudosia, there, who left the court in the 430s. For reasons that will be discussed later, Nabanugi fled Constantinople with the eunuch Mitradates in about 437, not to Georgia, although Mitradates was from Lazica, thus from the same region as his companion. Rather, they moved to the Holy Land. Peter's first migration there. Around this time, they visited Mount Nebo in Jerusalem. They were hosted by Melania del Yanga, who was connected to Eudokia, who granted them access to the male monastery she had founded. Its abbot Gerontius, also Melania's biographer, biographer, gave him the Christian name Peter, and his friend was henceforth called John. Soon Peter and John went into business for themselves and with the financial means still at their disposal, founded a place of lodging for pilgrims from Iberia at the Tower of David in Jerusalem. But they abandoned the project after a while and went back to the monastery of Gerontius. When the emperor's wife Eudokia, who had left the imperial court again in a dispute, came to Jerusalem in 443, she sought contact with Peter. The latter, however, evaded her and eventually retired as a monk to Mayuma, the seaport of Gaza, which was considered a city in its own right. While Gaza, Gaza was considered to be a haven of pagan tradition, Mayuma was Christian. After the Council of Chalcedon, both conflict parties courted Peter. He decided against Juvenal, the follower of Chalcedon, and agreed to his consecration as bishop by, of Mayuma by Theodosius, already mentioned. With this, he got into serious controversy. For John Rufus, this is the time of Maduto, defection, while a, a homonymous Syriac word can also denote the instructive um, punishment of God, a chastisement Maduso. A play on the double meaning is quite conceivable, perhaps even in a translation. If so, the translation would be relatively free, which would be again, again a problem for the historicity. John refers to the opposing bishops as marude, apostates, which suggests that he will, we was thinking mainly of the first meaning. 
um, defection. It is time that according to the Vita calls for him who must therefore become a bishop. It's significant how John speaks about his role as a bishop. His migration, the Branuto, to this place was guided by the divine care of God, the all wise one and the guardian of our souls who prepared in advance for his town on the seashore and very Christian, a high priest and bishop, one who was worthy of it, episcop episcopacy. Especially in the time of the defection, this is a translation, um, Horn Phoenix prefer rebellion, but defection seems better to me. Of defection, Madutho, this town was in need of such a man. Thus, this portrait not so much as a fighter for the faith, but someone, someone who can stand up for the sinful people before God. By the way, the, um, the whole passage shows that his whole life is guided by God, a motive to which I will come back later. However, in 453, Peter had to flee from Mayuma, probably due to the pressure of the Chalcedonians and evaded to Egypt, where he lived temporarily in hiding, but was also involved in the sometimes violent conflicts between Chalcedonians and their opponents. In 475, he returned to Mayuma and founded a monastery in Ashkelon. It is quite conceivable that he had benefited from the rule of the emperor or usurper Basiliscus, who favored the Miaphysites and, for example, installed Peter Fullo as bishop in Antioch. The fall of Basiliscus, however, seems to have had no effect on Peter the Iberian, unlike in the case of Peter Fullo. Peter lived if one trusts the Vita, henceforth unmolested in Palestine, and could undertake numerous journeys, even if it was not granted to him to enter Jerusalem anymore, probably because he did not join the offers of reconciliation of the Chalcedonian Bishop Martyrius there. Nor did he accept an invitation to Constantinople extended by Emperor Zeno, who sought compromise between Chalcedonians and Miaphysites. Peter died, in 491 and was immediately venerated as a saint by his followers. He may have been succeeded in the episcopate by John Rufus, his biographer. The Miaphysite sources we have, we have are unanimous in their regard for Peter. He leads a strictly ascetic life and cares for the needy. He appears as someone who is granted numerous visions from God or angels. He expresses himself prophetically. He works miracles with which he heals people, but he also provides them with food and does other good. The authors always assimilate him to the apostles. Thus, he occupies a high place in the Miaphysite tradition. Zacharias dedicates to him a whole chapter in his church history, in particular, in particular in his role as a wonder worker. In the Vita of Severus, he praises him for his philosophy, his monastic way of life, and his apostolic miracle. miracles. He even suggests that he is a vessel of God like Paul. The Vita of John Rufus, which transmits the most details, characterizes the whole life as God-directed and indulges in vivid descriptions of his miracles. The text offers a peculiarity compared to the other sources. It emphasizes Peter's strangeness. Xenayutho, um, a Syriac word that derives from the Greek word xenos. Cornelia Horn has worked this out convincingly, but we have to keep in mind that this concept turns up in many vitae of holy persons. Characteristic for John's approach is the following sentence, which he inserts into an account on a visit by Peter to the city of Ashdod. There the old man is, offering lodge, is offered lodgings in the city, but he prefers a cramped, run-down place with no room for physical needs, right on the coast. For in lodgings like these, the blessed one rejoiced as one who is a stranger and a foreigner. However, at this place, he and his companions are singled out by numerous believers, making the humble hut seem like a royal palace. In a sense, Peter thus returns to his beginnings, in his humility. The sentence is in a prominent place in John's work, just before he moves on to the narrative of the hero's dying. He highlights two aspects of strangeness. Sorry. He 
he highlights two aspects of strangeness, that of the traveler and that of not really arriving at any place. Even though John emphasizes these qualities strongly, they were not unusual qualities for a Christian. For the Christian's principal strangeness in the world is already emphasized by New Testament writings in various places. For example, first letter of Peter. Significant is a sentence in 29. He yearned, he yearned to depart from the world and from its vanity and to hasten to the first of virtues, which is axinayutho. Juan Phoenix translates the word as pilgrimage, which is true in a spiritual sense, but it's about distancing from the world at all, not just about traveling to a pilgrimage destination. In John's Vita, strangeness plays a special role, but in my opinion, it is less about traveling as such than about distancing from the world, which then also entails traveling. I mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to discuss the conditions, goals, and justifications of migration and mobility in Palestine based on my case study. Two phases can be distinguished. The first is Peter's migration to Jerusalem, that is, the flight from Constantinople. He spent a relatively quiet period in Jerusalem, although he moved between various religious institutions there. This was followed by the migration to Egypt, again a flight. The second phase of his life in Palestine starts with his remigration to Mayuma, his Episcopal, Episcopal See. There begins a period of the most intense mobility. Let us start with the conditions of the journeys. Apparently, Peter never traveled alone. Already on the flight to Jerusalem, John accompanied him. Also in the later journeys, Rufus always speaks in the plural, since he belonged to Peter's circle in the first person plural, very often. It is a community that travels, led by Peter, and it's quite visible. Even when he's still traveling through Asia Minor under the name Nabanugi, that is, when he is on the run, he is publicly welcomed, even expected, with his friend. Flight is probably a dramatizing designation for his departure from Constantinople, when also he is nothing about henchmen trading, trading him. On the later journeys, Peter apparently also has someone with him to run errands. Although humility was part of his self-presentation, and Peter, according to John Rufus, emphasizes that he was afraid of being too honored, the travels in Palestine were obviously visible and one cannot help thinking that this visibility was not undesirable, if not for Peter, at least for his companions. <coughs> Mobility costs money. Even an ascetic occasionally needs something to eat and a place to sleep. On the first migration to Jerusalem, Peter and John possess financial resources as well as religious resources, namely relics of Persian martyrs that Peter had brought from Georgia, to Constantinople and now carried on. It is these sacred objects that cause the fugitives to be greeted with enthusiasm in many places. They must, however, deliver the relics in Jerusalem where they are consecrated by Cyril at the request of Eudokia. In traveling through Palestine since 475, the second phase, Peter apparently has financial resources that Rufus does not like to talk about, but which he presupposes. Above all, he, Peter, is himself a religious resource. He has the reputation of sanctity and arouses general admiration with his ascetic way of life, the consequences of which must have been visible. Again and again, he has visions. In addition, he constantly works miracles he heals people, he ensures that food multiplies, he also obtains rain and makes a vineyard, he exercises demons. Thus he aligns himself with Jesus, although he is addressed primarily as an apostle. In some places, people wait for him in the hope that he will do miracles there. Because of his charisma, he is also recognized by opponents of the faith. He converts many people um, to orthodoxy or to ascetic life. For on various occasions, he shows parousia, expressed with a Syriac loanword, frankness, as is due to saints. By the way, the fact that Peter has religious authority has another consequence, namely that he becomes the target of mobility, because pilgrims want to get to know him, 
So is mobile himself, but triggers mobility as well. But what is decisive for the success of his journeys is the anti chalcedonian at least non-Chalcedonian network. In many places, there are co-religionists with whom they can take shelter, also monasteries that offer security, sometimes the network of those who had been involved with Empress Eudokia, who of course was already dead when Peter returned, plays a role. But Peter does not want to get too involved with them in the portrayal of Rufus. Perhaps the reference to a court, which also evoked his distinguished origins, was opposed to this. On the other hand, the Vita also reveals that Peter continued to maintain contacts with Constantinople and with influential people in Constantinople. In some places, Peter had to convince the inhabitants of his sanctity through miracles. The dogmatic finesses are then not addressed, as in general, dogmatic questions play only a minor role in this text. Peter travels as a holy man, a bearer of far radiating charismatic authority who supports the anti chalcedonians the Orthodox from his viewpoint, but is not described as an aggressive propagator of his faith. Religious conflict with the Chalcedonians um, is not pro prominent, are not prominent. No acts of violence toward the anti chalcedonians occur. There is also no indication that any political authorities intervened. Some municipal magistrates even support the tour group. Just to avoid misunderstandings, the Vita is not a reportage on the realities of interconfessional life in Palestine in the second half of the fifth century, but an idealized description of an actor. That the situation was more tense than the Vita suggests is shown by the fact that Peter, to the astonishment of his followers, does not dare to enter Jerusalem. I come now to the goals of the journeys. A life of quiet and humility had been Peter's habit, as Rufus maintains. Traveling tears him out of that. Basically, he travels at the pressure of the others, of others, or to fulfill wishes of others whom he wants to help. Peter is forcibly transported by followers to Jerusalem for consecration. Even when he travels to the holy springs, in Nabataean territory for heeding, he does so at the urging of his companions. Always, John justifies Peter's mobility with higher reasons and insistently describes miracles that accompany it. However, John Rufus also describes personal motives for migration and mobility. For example, Peter flees Constantinople because he longs for Jerusalem and wants to escape the temptation of bad life. As is proper, he also tries to avoid ecclesiastic, ecclesiastical office. When he leaves Jerusalem, the goal is to save his soul, soul from the temptation of Eudokia, although elsewhere there's talk of the Chalcedonian defection, the Madutho, as a reason. As a young man and layman, however, he also engages in a kind of pious tourism as he wants to see famous monks with his friends. For Rufus, the self-motivation and the commitment to others as motives that he assumes are not contradictory. Um, since, above all, Peter is guided by the Holy Spirit of, or even by God himself. There is thus always a double causality, as indeed there is elsewhere in Christian-influenced narratives, and above all, this is the crucial justification for his intense mobility that is difficult to contest. It should be considered, however, whether Rufus had the intention to protect Peter against the accusation of too high mobility because his highly famous, though here unnamed, also a set of contemporary was Simon Stylitis, a follower of the Council of Chalcedon, who was particularly stationary due to his ascetic practice. But I'm not sure about that. At least in the Vita of Theodosius, there is a chapter where people try to convert Simon Stylitis to anti chalcedonism but he proves to be too, um, too stupid in the description. Despite his intensive traveling, two destinations remain out of Peter's reach. One destination had been imposed on him, the other he strove for, Constantinople and Jerusalem. As regards Constantinople, the Emperor Zenon invites him. 
The latter, as I mentioned, tried to come to an agreement with the Anti-Chalcedonians. It's very probable that the Empress saw in Peter, who also enjoyed respect among his religious opponents, someone who could support his compromise solution. John Rufus, by the way, is much less sharply Anti-Chalcedonian in the Vita than in the Pleroforiae, where Peter features as an Anti-Chalcedonian hardliner. But Peter once again goes on the run, which interestingly takes him north, toward Constantinople, and again, this flight is conducted in a group and is quite visible. At the same time, he mobilizes his network in Constantinople, which eventually manages to get him disinvited again, according, according to John Rufus's account. However, it's unclear to me at least whether he was disinvited as his own re request or due of machinations of others. In any case, he did not return to Constantinople. Jerusalem, where Peter had lived for a long time, was his Sehnsuchtsort, place of longing during the second stay in Palestine. Protected by a former courtier of Eudokia, Theodorus, he stays near the city for a long time, but does not enter it, to the amazement and even disappointment of his companions, until one of them has a vision that shows Peter visiting and venerating all the important religious sites of the city as well as Bethlehem and Rachel's tomb. <clears throat> this was the standard program of Jerusalem pilgrims at this time, which Peter calls the holy route, Rechta Kadisha. The standardized visit of the city is thus spiritualized. The claim to possess the holy places was not given up, even it could not be physically redeemed. This ties well, ties in well with a tendency to deterritorialize the church also visible in John of Ephesus' work. Conclusions. The picture of migration and mobility in fifth century Palestine that emerges from the Vita of Peter the Iberian is complex. Of course, Jerusalem is the most important destination, which Peter understandably strives for during this escape from the palace. There he can move relatively freely in the time before Chalcedon and can be active in different functions. His contacts with the Iberians also play a role there. Rufus had reported that he had broken off all relations with his homeland and his family, but in Jerusalem he runs a pilgrimage quarter for Iberians. This is briefly mentioned thereafter Iberians do not turn up in the Vita. Although Peter later gains great importance for Georgian tradition, as we have seen, even in the Chalcedonian sense. The struggles after Chalcedon led Peter to leave first Jerusalem, then Palestine. That he returned to Palestine can be explained by the changes since Basiliscus, but may also be explained by the fact that there was no one in this region comparable to him in authority while there was now an anti-Chalcedonian bishop in Alexandria, in Egypt. In the time of Zeno, according to the picture drawn by the Vita, a relatively undisturbed mobility was possible while he still had experienced violence in Egypt. As an embodied saint, Peter traveled the country and he did so according to the account of Rufus in a visible way and unmolested. It's quite conceivable that under Zeno, who was willing to compromise, peaceful mobility was indeed possible even for opponent of Chalcedon. But one must take again into account here the idealizing picture of Rufus, who strove to make it clear that Peter, as embodied holiness, was recognized everywhere and respected by everybody. But his report also shows that there were limits to the coexistence. Jerusalem was apparently not accessible to Peter. Nevertheless, the Vita reveals that there was a reliable network of non chalcedonians that allowed a man like Peter to travel to large parts of the country um, dominated by Chalcedonians, but it also reveals that there was a common ground beyond confessional conflicts, shaped by personal charisma and by the impression of being holy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting paper and the 
the floor is open. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Really very enjoyable. Um, I just wanted to, to, uh, to ask whether you had any thoughts. Uh, I'll say two things. One, one is a note just to, to say in case you had forgotten uh, that in the, in the title of John of Ephesus' Lives of the Eastern Saints, he actually refers to himself, if the title is his own, and I think it is, he refers to himself as an ex noyo, a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think that's probably a genuine uh, ascription because uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't use that word himself elsewhere and uh, uh, it's not one of the typical, uh, uh, he's, usually, you know, he's usually described as John of Asia uh, or John of Ephesus elsewhere. But I wanted to ask whether you had any uh, sense of kind of, um, in the longer term, like a developing system of, of uh, control about uh, itinerant uh, ascetics or itinerant um, clergy like Peter. Because I was just reading the other day uh, The Life of Barsamo, which has which been recently translated. Um, and Barsamo, of course, is this figure who is famously itinerant and famously a nuisance. Um, but Peter appears in this text, as, as you describe him, as, as for the most part, uh, moving respectably without interference, um, and it only, it, it, only, it only seems to be an issue in, in Jerusalem. So, so I wondered whether you have a sense of whether it's in this context, in the immediate aftermath of Chalcedon, that we're starting to see um, a control, controls of where clergy are allowed to go become an issue? Or is this just a matter of genre? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, words that has, have something to do with being a stranger, being a xenos in Syrian Greek, turn up very often in lives of any saints in the verb, in the literal sense, and also in the more metaphorical sense. And um, as you said, it's unclear whether this title of the Vitae is John's, I'm relatively optimistic that it is the case because as Peter, he also had been very mobile and his mobility is also visible in his Vitae. If I remember well, he uses the word again um, in the context of the Vitae of the women who traveled to Jerusalem. I should check it, but I seem to remember it, but I should check it. and. Um, if this is the case, then it might be worth studying the relationship between this word and Jerusalem, whether there is anything special in the mere for that context. I'm not sure about this, but this might be possible why John himself never was, as far as we can say, in Jerusalem, in this place he nevertheless had to revere. The second question, the itinerant um, holy people. For me, they are a problem. So um, I find a figure like Simon Stylites much more plausible because he is not the one who goes to other people in order to invest them how, somehow in his life, but he has people come to him. He is very, he's extremely stationary. But on the other hand, we would know that stylites who then move, who climb down from their columns and move on like the Ura in um, John of Ephesus' Vitae, are figures who impress the public immensely. So the relation between being stationary and mobility is extremely important. The mobility has the great advantage that it shows the strangeness, and it has the immense practical advantage, in my view, that it helps to strengthen the networks, because people come to certain places. Our Vita can't say, oh, he was a good networker and therefore he traveled along, but they have to say that it's God's will, that's the Holy Spirit that moved the people to the different places, to their co-religionists. But in the end, it's a very efficient way of um, keeping a network working, 
which is again visible in John's Vitae, where he shows how he comforts his people, how he even um, ordains priests in churches clandestinely in these things, which is very important, which gives a good idea of the complexity of the situation and of the importance of still being present, although being persecuted, and the rules that were very strong on clergymen not to travel on their own account um, don't seem to have been applied by me. It's an interesting question, because otherwise they are very punctilious in following canons. So this uh, is a very good thought, but I am not sure. I have the impression they avoid this thing, but one should check. We should check whether there is a correct connection, perhaps, and there is a mentioning of being allowed to travel. They are being allowed by the most important figure, by God, but it's, this is something everybody could claim. Thank you very much. I uh, was very interested in this talk as an excavator in Costa Las Otos. And, uh, I was hoping to find the place where Peter uh, stayed uh, during that year in Azotos, uh, I didn't find the place, unfortunately. But it was very modest, yeah? So you, mm -hmm. you showed us uh, what John Rufus said. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is interesting is that uh, Rufus, in his vita, he also says that Peter became, uh, uh, he says two things. You mentioned the money. Mm -hmm. So he was offered the best houses in the city, uh, which he refused. So apparently there was a network of very wealthy citizens mm -hmm. that supported his journey, we can assume perhaps. And the, the another thing is that he became a magnet for mm -hmm. uh, all people from, uh, uh, from, from the region of Azoto. So and, and from far away, they came mm -hmm. uh, to see him and to pre uh, when he was preaching. So, so it's another wave of mobility, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, which would, uh, of course, support your, I think, your general thesis. Mm. Another thing is that what is very interesting is that in this charge that you, you know about this, that we were excavated in Azotos, uh, one of the inscriptions which uh, Lea de Seni uh, uh, has translated and offered her interpretation, one of the very interesting inscriptions in the chapel of the church, she identifies this inscription with the uh, Bishop uh, Stephanus, who was a Bishop of Yamnia, but he was a very staunch supporter of Chalcedonian doctrine. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, replaced uh, uh, in Yamnia, and she says that he found, perhaps, he found a refuge in Azotos, uh, and he was buried as a, maybe as a saint, as a venerated person in this chapel in the church which we excavated. So it's also very interesting that you have, just a, a few years before Peter arrives, you have an anti-Chalcedonian person who is uh, venerated there, and suddenly Peter arrives and they give uh, all the honors to Peter. So this, all this mm. very crazy, flexible situation uh, between different uh, branches of Christianity in one place, I think it's really fascinating. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think perhaps our sources are crazy with the distinctions and with the confrontational picture of the confessions. I think this was very important on a certain level of church politics, on the most influential level of church politics. But my impression is that when it came to concrete situations, the evidence of holiness was much more important. And, um, but this is something which is not really discussed in our sources or only as a deviation. Oh, the people didn't understand the difference and so they followed this uh, seemingly holy man. But um, I think we should respect much more the evidence we have for transconfessional perspectives simple trust in um, holiness. And if you would trust, if you trusted holiness better, you could find Peter's place, certainly with the miracle he would done to you, but uh, this, uh, you don't, as you don't believe in it, now you I can't. It. Now I trust it, but <laughs> <laughs> you, must, you must improve your faith. So in the, in the question of, um, uh, what was the second question again? Um, oh, about the, the, the support of, uh, the, of Chalcedon. Yeah, the rich people, yes. yes. And this is, um, this is also one of the 
tensions of the life of a holy person because as soon as they become popular and they win rich supporters, this is also a temptation. And they have to show that they are free from this temptation, that they are able to act independently from this temptation, although these people were useful. And John of Ephesus, for example, is proud of every high magistrate who supports the Miaphysites, and nevertheless, he criticizes all the wealthy people. And this was a difficult way to go, a difficult way to negotiate for these people, and Peter had to keep his image as a verhumilis. Uh, and so, it was absolutely consistent to live in this small hut, and the effect was clear in the description of Rufus, people came to him would be interesting to know whether they had come to him if he had spent, if he had spent his time in the house of a rich man. Simon. Uh, I wonder if the Council of Saragossa from 380 will help, which reads that it says that Christians should not be concealed in houses, nor stay on estates, nor mm. head for the mountains, nor walk in bare feet, but to flock to the mm. churches. Mm. And they even try and ban ascetic practices, and they even try and ban reading on your own. Mm. Yeah. And what you can see from the Saragossa Council, this is going back to the question of the, uh, of, of the stylites, yeah. first, which I'm going to talk about in my, actually, bizarrely, I'm going to talk about movement versus mm. stability mm. in my talk. But there is actually an internal conflict Mm -hmm. throughout Christianity in this period about what is correct worship mm -hmm. and how to place it. And there's quite a strong church movement saying, just come to church. Mm -hmm. And that actually has to be built into that picture about mobility yeah. and non-mobility and who's in control of the authority, who has authority in this period is still mm -hmm. very much up for grabs. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of uh, sitting just outside Jerusalem in your villa Mm -hmm. is actually not something that you might not think is so good, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, not, maybe not so good to sit outside mm -hmm. in your villa. You may be actually making a point about where is authority. And granted, he's come from Theodosius and Eudokia's mm -hmm. palace, which is one claim on authority, mm -hmm. and he's not going to the center of Jerusalem. He's got, so where is he? Part of my question is Nestorians. How does he relate to Nestorians? How does he relate instead of just anti chalcedons and mm. part of my question is just, can he be fitted in, or is he trying really hard to avoid being fitting in, in mm. a way that someone like Saragossa would say, stop it, just mm. come to church? Yes, important questions. Um, the historians do not turn up. They are not an issue for him or for John Rufus, um, he, there's no sign that he was against the Council of Ephesus. He would have accepted this. In this sense, um, he would certainly reject Nestorianism in positions defined as Nestorian. And the more fundamental question, um, in the end it comes down to um, um, this um, Weberian typology then taken up by Adolf von Harnack between Amtscharisma and individual charisma. So charisma connected with an office and charisma connected with an individual. And this is something Christianity and problem Christianity never resolves because the institutions have a clear interest, a very rational interest in controlling every movement and in showing and making clear who has the real authority. And this can be only an organized authority. But every bishop who gets involved in mundane bishop, and no bishop can avoid being involved in mundane bishop in, in offices, is again, then has to confront charismatic individuals. And he can be criticized on this level. And this is a never-ending process. And this is the huge advantage of people such as Peter, who pretend not to be too much involved with official institutions, although, as you rightly said, Part of his authority is that he had been at the court and that he was from royal origins, but his move then to renounce on these relationships publicly is a very good move because, because of this move, everybody knew that he had these origins. And so it's like the Damnatio Memoria in Rome. If you make Damnatio Memoria, the, the person who suffers it 
such as her, will be remembered. And so somebody who says, oh, it's so unimportant for me that I'm of royal origins, is remembered as somebody who has these origins. And so the Peter, as this depicted by John Rufus, is a very smart um, spin doctor of himself, to put it this way. Very, very good comparison with Sulpicius, Severus, and Martin. Yes, 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 exactly, yes. Very similar, yeah. More questions? You cannot escape royal, uh, royal pedigree. Eventually, he passed away uh, in Yavne Yam mm -hmm. at the villa of Eudokia. Yeah? So, mm -hmm. so, so, <laughs> so he, he didn't die uh, in a poor house in Azotus. Mm -hmm. He was taken to imperial villa. So, mm -hmm. you are who you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but is the script described as nothing what he intended? Oh. Unfortunately for him. It was done to him. Yeah. Thank you. On this happy note, I think we shall thank uh, both presenters and the audience.